Lord, we declare that you are worthy today. And Lord, uh, just like creation groans, we groan for the day of the renewal that all things will be made right. And Lord, uh, as we open our, your word today, here in, in this service, as our kids open your word today, Lord, would you move in our hearts? Would we submit our way to you? Lord, we pray that this time would be a sweet savor to you. Lord, we pray that the worship of our hearts, the meditation of our heart would be acceptable. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, kids, uh, if you guys want to head on to Kids Church, I didn't forget about you. I wanted to pray for you today as well. So thank you, teachers, for uh, teaching and uh, for all the kids that are here. Have a great time. So we're talking about the uh, upside-down kingdom. And over the past uh, few weeks, we've been finding out uh, what it is that this kingdom is made of. And it's unlike any kingdom that uh, we've ever experienced. The aspects that rule this kingdom are completely subversive to the things that rule the kingdoms of this world. In fact, the conduct and character that Christ lays out here of those who will take hold of this kingdom is completely antithetical to our experience and how kingdoms operate. For instance, uh, if you were to take one of these principles that we see in the Beatitudes and run for political office here in Germany or maybe in your home country, it's unlikely that a slogan based off one of these ideas would push your campaign forward. For instance, something like, vote for more, he'll make you poor, just isn't probably going to cut it. Or how about this, let's make America meek again. I don't know how well that would work. So as we reflect on Christ's words in relation to the conduct that we see reigning here on earth, these things seem far-fetched that they could rule any kingdom. I mean, it's not the humble or those who thirst for righteousness, those who show mercy or have pure hearts that seem to inherit kingdoms. Actually, it seems like ones that act this way are the ones that are constantly getting caught up in the gears of war. They're the ones that are the scapegoats as political kingdoms rise and fall. And it's here that we see the revolutionary nature of what Christ came to proclaim. That the things that rule his kingdom are opposite to the things that rule the kingdoms of earth. Which makes the Sermon on the Mount vitally important for us. Because I believe Christ has given us a road map to find our way to him and his kingdom. And we see Christ start his sermon here by laying down these critical threads that rule his kingdom. And he's identifying those of who it is that God is going to make happy. In fact, that's actually exactly what blessed means. That God is going to make these people, these ones, happy. And today he's making the meek happy. Our text is uh, Matthew 5, verse 5. I encourage you to open to it today. And we've got ten words that we're going to unpack today. Matthew 5, 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But what does it mean to be meek? I believe that all of us have an idea of what meekness is, right? But all of those who Christ says here are blessed, that we see that he says they're blessed, I think it's the meek that tend to be the most misunderstood. It's actually hard to really understand what it means to be meek in our modern languages because we don't really have a word that fully encompasses what it means, what meekness means. You probably have an idea in your head of what it means to be meek. We've all heard the, the phrase, meekness is not weakness. Okay, yeah, we know. That it's this idea of strength under control, that it's to be gentle maybe or mild-tempered. All these things, I think they help 
us construct this idea of what meekness is, but because of the word Matthew uses here, it's a, it's a word that uh, we can't completely capture in the English language. We tend to miss the historical significance of this word and how Christ has redefined what meekness really is. So we're going to start with just this classical understanding, this meaning of the Greek word. Uh, I hope I say it right. <laughs> I've practiced this before. Praetos. I think that's wrong. But anyways, I'm going to say praetos. So that's our Greek word for today. And it's a well-known word. It's actually one of the great uh, ethical words from the Greek language. It's uh, in its classical understanding. It it's this conno- has this connotation that uh, you know I think that we've adopted. Uh, that is this idea that it gives a picture of being submissive or mild, maybe an ineffective person, someone with no spark or zeal. That's kind of what we think. But this word means so much more in the Greek language. And the virtue of praetos was much sought after in the ancient world. And it actually became associated with someone who had mastered balancing their emotions. And the earliest usage of the word was actually associated with anger. And what we see uh, is the, that this is the mean between excessive anger and excessive angerlessness, if that's even a word. So Aristotle was actually one of the first to write on meekness, and he said it's this. It's this happy medium between too much and too little anger. Now, I know there may be some in the audience today that may be struggling with this, maybe a cause for concern to think of meekness through the lens of anger, right? You might say that uh, anger is never a redeemable quality. But what we find is that the audience that Matthew would have penned this letter to would have had seen meekness through a different lens and how it relates to anger. And with the historical background of this world, William Barclay uh, has commented that the one standing on the hillside that day might have interpreted Christ's words in this way, blessed are those who are always angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time. Now, I know some of you probably sitting here uh, are struggling with that, that there can be a good anger that could be associated with meekness. But before you tar and feather me, run me on a rail out of the church here, think about this with me. We very well have this picture in our minds of what anger looks like at the wrong time. Because we have a hard time not making anger about ourselves. You know, I, I get cut off on the road, and it costs me time, so I get angry. I get angry, right? We're on a trip, our family, with, with our kids, and one of our kids, one more time, asks the question, are we there yet? And my lack of patience unleashes a barrage of anger because, what, I'm frustrated. I'm angry. Now, you've probably noticed that a lot of my anger tends to happen in cars. So probably need to stay out of cars. But I'm going to turn it on you. You know, let's say that someone criticizes you at work or your work and your pride is hurt. So what happens? You get angry. So here's the thing. When, when anger becomes about what we need that we're not getting, then anger becomes a tool for the enemy. It gives the enemy the ability to use our emotions against us and cause destruction not only to ourselves, but to others. And this is the type of anger that reigns here on earth. We know this anger well. But I think what we must re- recognize is whether we want to or not, is that there is also an anger that seeks the good of others, a selfless anger that acts not for ourself, but for the love of others. And Barke, he comments further by saying this, selfish anger is always sin, but selfless anger can be one of the great moral dynamics of our world. Now, to be honest, I haven't figured out how to use this anger uh, in the right way. Uh, There always seems to be a little self that, that, that slips in. But regardless of whether we understand anger, it's important to understand how meekness relates to it 
and the historical context of this world, word because it leads us to understand another aspect of what it means to be meek, that meekness relates to self-control. Which brings us to the second standard Greek usage of this word, and the idea is that meekness involves control. And what we find in this word praetos is this word was used for an animal which had been domesticated. And as an animal was trained to obey the word of command, it would respond to the reins. And the word gives us a sense of someone who's learned to accept control. Now with this in mind, those standing on the hill that day listening to Jesus could have interpreted his words this way. Blessed are those who have every instinct, every impulse, every passion under control. Blessed are those who are entirely self-controlled. But as soon as we read that, uh, it, it kind of escapes us and, and gives us a cause for concern, right? Because if we're honest, when have we truly ever been entirely self-controlled? Now, we might have a, a season where we live with self-control, right? But what we find is that our resolve always wanes. We always lose control once again. In fact, I'll go ahead and tell you, you in of yourself are not capable of being self-controlled. Which is why I think that uh, if we really want to understand what it means to be meek, we now have to shift from a classical understanding of the word, of what it means to be self-controlled, to a gospel understanding of self-control. Because Christ has redefined what meekness means as it relates to control. And this is why the Sermon on the Mount is revolutionary. Because Christ is taking apart the structures the constructs, the, the definitions that make our world turn. And he says that the real kingdom operates differently. And in order to see this kingdom, we must address the issue of control. And what we must understand is that having control for ourselves is not the answer. We are living in a world that's desperately seeking to grab control, to take authority for ourselves. So meekness or control, the, the type that Jesus is speaking of, is different than the self-control that we believe rules our kingdom. Now living in Germany, I think that we, uh, we get a good picture of the type of self-control that rules society on earth. Now in German society, uh, it, German society is known for order, for keeping things in place, right? That the idea of being self-controlled here is prized in this society, other than maybe on Sylvester, right? And then, then like all chaos breaks loose. I don't know what happens there. <laughs> but what we must understand is that the way our world defines self-control is not the same way that Christ has defined it. You see, our world sees self-control as something that can be achieved on your own. It's self-righteous in nature. It's a type of self-control that makes us our own gods. What we find is that true self-control is found as one becomes God-controlled instead of self-controlled. It's a self-control imitated so well by Christ who was willing to submit himself to the Father, not because his nature required this. Don't forget, he was God. But because he became like us in every way to give us an example to follow, an example that followed his Father's will. What he's teaching us today is that to be meek is to stop trying to control things on our own and allow God to take the reins. We just sang about it earlier, that God would reign in us. You might be sitting here today finding it hard to do this, that. When you've worked so hard to gain control, anyone or anything that would take control away from you, then that is a threat to your kingdom. But brother and sister, I say this gently and with love. The difficult people or the tough circumstances that God has placed in your life that seem to be wrestling control away from you, they are not your greatest problem. Your greatest problem is your belief that you are in control. The problem is not that you've lost control of your life or that you haven't gained control of your life yet, but you have a problem with who really is in control. When you've misunderstood what it means to be self-controlled, 
that this is not about how you can gain control, but recognizing how spiritually bankrupt you are to control things. And Steve, you talked about this two weeks ago, the spiritual poverty that is central to our dilemma. Ultimately, you've misunderstood who it is that God is making happy, that the blessed are those who come to him with nothing to offer, that the meek, to be meek really means to be humble. It's humility that underlies every aspect of Christ's kingdom, and it is those who banish their pride and come to him with a gentle and lowly heart that will find him. This might be why you're here today, actually. You might be seeking him. You might be like one of those who Paul mentions in Acts 17 that are feeling their way towards him. They're, they're searching almost as they're in the dark, groping for him. You're seeking to know who God is. And I tell you today that he is not far off. And if you'll humble yourself, if you'll recognize your poverty before a righteous God, your sin, and ask Christ to take control of your life, then I can promise you that his grace will invade your heart, that you will find him. And two weeks ago in Postum, I preached on the, the woman at the well. I love this, this passage in John 4. And I was reminded that this is where the woman encountered Jesus in all her shame. It's where she realized just how unrighteous she really was. When Jesus confronted her with her sin, she didn't make excuses, but she humbled herself to acknowledge her condition. And then she realized that Christ could do something about her problem. And it was at this moment that she gave him control and accepted his gracious gift of living water. What she came to understand was that Jesus didn't want her hypocrisy that postures religiously, but he wanted her honesty and her heart. And what she found is that God is seeking true worshipers. In John 4, verse 24, verse 23, Christ says, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. He's seeking people that will worship him in spirit and truth. He's not seeking religious people or people that think they have everything together. The Father is seeking out the gentle and the lowly in heart, those who recognize their poverty before him and know that he is their only hope to make everything right. And I point out the Samaritan woman today because when she was confronted with her sin, it was a gentle and lowly heart that led her to encounter Christ's identity. She realized that it wasn't her sin that was capable of keeping her from the Father because Christ was coming to change that, but that in order to come to him, she must come to him, his, her, his son, the Father's son, and lay down her pride and thinking she could achieve righteousness on her own. So what we must understand is that it's not simply being humble it's not simply those that mourn or, or to be meek that gains us entrance to the kingdom of God. But as we seek these things and we encounter Christ, that he has authority to translate us from God's kingdom as we believe on his son, as we believe in his atonement for us on, on our behalf by his blood. All these beatitudes, they're like threads that lead us to Christ the door of salvation. And these threads, as we follow them, we find that they're attached to this door that we encounter Christ, the one who stands between heaven and earth and has been given all authority to grant us life. So it is those who come to him with humble hearts that find him. And it's pretty amazing to see what he offers those who trust him. And notice who it is that will inherit heaven and earth in verse 3 and 5 of our text in Matthew 5. Verse 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then look at verse 5, our, our text for today. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So we see this relationship between the poor in spirit and the meek, how they together will become inherit, inheritors of heaven and earth. 
In fact, in the Old Testament, the, the poor in spirit was actually synonymous with the meek. And we see this reflected in the prophecy from Isaiah 61 that, that Martin brought to our attention last week. It says in Isaiah 61, uh, verse 1 and 2, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has appointed, appointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Christ is bringing new clarity to what awaits those favored by God, that Christ has been anointed to bring good news to the poor and to proclaim liberty to the captives, to the meek. And what we see, I highlighted this purposely so that we can see how this prophecy was fulfilled. That God's plan is, was destined for the gentle and lowly to become inheritors of heaven and earth. And Christ has brought forth the year of the Lord's favor and God's favor is coming to those in poverty and that he has not forgotten his promise to make happy the powerless. And don't miss what it is that the poor and meek are inheriting today. They are inheriting God's reconciled kingdom of heaven and earth. And as we see Christ speak these words, we see the upside down kingdom come into view. That Christ came to fulfill the Father's will of reconciling the kingdom of heaven with earth. And that the gentle and the lowly will take possession of it. Christ came to stand between heaven and earth to bring peace to God's kingdom. And these upside down principles that rule the kingdom of heaven, he proclaimed here on earth so that this rift between heaven and earth could be healed. And this is what he's doing. He is bringing heaven and earth back together in the Beatitudes. These principles of the upside down kingdom help us understand how we can partake in the restoration that is coming. Remember what Christ encouraged his disciples to pray that the Father's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is the call of the disciple of Christ that we would desire the Father's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what I mean by this is that the principles of this kingdom, this upside-down kingdom, are not only what guide us to encountering Christ and believing on him, but also help us understand how we can participate with Christ in the restoration of his kingdom. And just as we must relinquish control of our kingdom to see the kingdom of God to come into faith through Christ by grace, so must we also decide to live meekly if we're to proclaim his kingdom on earth, if we're to live by faith. But how can we live meekly? That's a tough one, isn't it? Because even though Christ has begun the reconciliation of heaven and earth, we recognize the brokenness around us. We recognize the brokenness that's still present in our own hearts that we must deal with every day. And to be honest, I feel very inadequate standing in front of you today as someone qualified to talk about how we can live meekly. And so many times I see in my own heart pride rising up inside. I see myself trying to grab control of my kingdom once again. But I'm thankful today to know that for all those who are in Christ, we have everything we need to walk in this way. And as we surrender control to his command, then we're equipped to live meekly. And I believe we find in our text a starting point for how we can dwell with this gentle and lowly heart that we're talking about in this present age where we're at right now. Did you notice who the blessed are that we find between those inheriting heaven and earth? Look at verse 4 of Matthew chapter 5 again with me. Verse 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We find those who mourn in between those who are inheriting heaven and earth. And this helps us understand this not yet state that we're in right now as we wait for Christ's return. 
And what we find is that there's something in this present age that's working to produce a gentle and lowly heart in God's people. And if we want to understand how we can live meekly in this life, then we must rest in the fact that our mourning is serving a purpose, that our suffering is serving a purpose. Mourning serves the purpose of making us meek, and those who have submitted themselves to God's control are those who mourn over the current state of things. They recognize that this is not the way that it's supposed to be. And what they do is they come again and again to the reality of the brokenness around them, the brokenness in them. And this creates a longing in their heart for the day that Christ will make everything right. Paul says it this way in Romans 8, 18 and 19. He says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us for creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Your mourning is serving a purpose, and it's serving the purpose of helping make you meek. And, to, and Paul, he reminds us that suffering at this present time, it's not going to compare to the glory that will be revealed. And what we find is that suffering is serving the purpose of revealing the true sons and daughters of God. That's pretty amazing. James says it another way. He says in uh, James 1, 2, and 3, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That every trial is not an attack from the enemy, but that there's a purpose behind it. And James says, hold on, brothers and sisters, your suffering is shaping you into a gentle and lowly people, a people that Jesus says will inherit heaven and earth. So be patient. Wait for God to act on your behalf instead of taking control of this situation in front of you on your own for yourself. And there's a great way that we can practically wait on God. And it's happening this week as we call you to a week of fasting and prayer. And at the heart of what we're doing this week is not trying to fabricate suffering. There's enough suffering going on in this world right now. But our lament has a good purpose of renewing a right spirit in us. We're seeking to rest in the fact that our mourning is serving the purpose of setting aside our normal rhythms and our schedules to mourn over the brokenness that we see in our world, that we see in our city, that we see in our community, and most importantly, that we see in our own hearts. That this is creating a new heart in us that is gentle and lowly and dependent foremost on God. That's what we're doing this week. So how can we live meekly? Know that your mourning is serving a purpose. And secondly, rest in the fact that God has given us everything that we need to live meekly. And what you need to know today is that in spite of what it may seem, right now, in this moment, God has you right where he wants you. And not only this, but he's equipped you in every way for this moment to walk by faith. So we must depend on him in every moment, especially in the moments that we feel that we want to grab the reins. We must be patient to wait on God to guide us in the moment that we feel an impulse, an instinct or a passion rising up inside of us that would seek to grab control once again. We must train ourselves to respond to God's reign. And it's easy to live in a state of feeling crippled to live a godly life, isn't it? But we need to understand that we don't have to. That God has given us everything we need. Peter says it this way in 2 Peter 1, starting in verse 3, he says, His divine power has granted us to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. 
through Christ, we know that God will keep his promises. And because of this, that he has granted us this power to live for his purposes, to walk differently than the world around us, we're capable of doing this. And Peter, he mentions how we're to supplement our faith as he continues in verse 5. He says this, For the, this very reason, make every effort to supplement, supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfast, steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. It's leading us to understanding how we can love like Christ. Peter says these things are available to you because we have become partakers in the nature of Christ. And did you notice that right in the middle of this list of things that are available to us, Peter mentions self-control, what we've been talking about. Now, Peter, he wasn't known for being self-controlled. I mean, we think of Peter as the one that's lopping off ears in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? But what we come to understand is that Peter now sees this as a critical virtue that we must have. That living, living meekly impacts those around us because it leads us to living with brotherly affection and love for those around us. And when we have self-control, then this becomes possible to love those around us, which can be tough sometimes. Ultimately, what Peter is saying is that this is how those who follow Christ live in peace. That peace is rooted in love for others. And you want to know how you can live meekly? Then don't miss our final point today. That to live meekly, we must rest in the fact that we are made to delight in peace. And what we find in this third beatitude is that it points us to the fulfillment of David's words in Psalm 37, 11. David says, but the meek shall inherit the land. And then look what he says next, and delight themselves in abundant peace. Christ is bringing forth what David said would come to pass. And we are reminded that not only are the meek inheritors of the, the earth, that this is our future reality, but we can delight ourselves in abundant peace in the here and now, in this present moment. You know what the meek desire to bring into every situation? Peace. Because they delight in it. And this has implications for how we'll deal with others regardless of how they deal with us. And how we deal with others will be the true measure of whether we're really living meekly. Martin Lloyd-Jones says that meekness can, uh, can, found in the taking, can be found in, the, in taking a true estimate of oneself and his attitude towards others. He notes that it's pretty easy to be honest with ourselves before God, to acknowledge that we're sinners. But how much more difficult is it to allow other people to say things like that about us? Our response to accusations against us, whether they're justified or not, is an indication of whether meekness is present in our lives. John Stott, he uh, made this practical by giving this example. He says this, I myself am quite happy to recite the general confession in church and call myself a miserable sinner. It causes me no great problem. But let somebody else come to me after church and call me a miserable sinner, and I want to punch him in the nose. In other words, I'm not prepared to allow other people to think or speak of me what I have just acknowledged before God that I am. He says that in this way, there's a basic hypocrisy here. There always is when meekness is absent. A truly meek person responds to the accusations or insults of others with gentleness, humility, sensitivity, and patience because they delight themselves in abundant peace. The gentle and the lowly bear with the shortcomings of others because they recognize their own shortcomings. A.W. Tozier said in his book, The Pursuit of God, that the one who is meek rests in the fact that he has stopped being fooled by himself and ex has accepted God's estimate of his own life. Therefore, his motto becomes, in himself nothing, 
in God everything. And it's here where we learn how to delight in peace because we no longer have to hide our poverty. We no longer have to hide our sin, but we can be honest about it. We can bring it into the light. And it's here that we stop pretending and find strength to accept ourselves for what we really are. That we are both nothing and everything before God. And this sets us to be free because we no longer have to be anxious about what other people think as long as God is pleased. We now delight in abundant peace. We're happy to let God defend us because meekness has invaded our hearts and we desire to bring peace to God's kingdom instead of strife. Ultimately, those who are meek are those who have come true, become truly amazed that God and men would treat them so well. And as they comprehend God's grace to them, they pour out his grace to others so that his kingdom will come. Recognize today that God's upside-down kingdom is at hand, and it belongs to the meek. Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you have done. And Lord, as we stand here today, we remember your work on our behalf. Lord, we remember your meekness and how this led you to a cross so that we could be set free. Lord, help us to understand how we can walk in the same way, how we can walk meekly like you, how we can desire peace. Lord, thank you. We love you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.